Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Roberts, curator of modern and contemporary art. I was sad to see that music, uh, hear that music go. You might think you're at a dance party, but welcome to the curated conversations. Um, I'm so delighted to um, welcome you to the latest iteration of our series, Curated Conversations with artist Edric Brackens, whose exhibition, Darling Divine, is currently on view in the contemporary project space at the Blanton. It's just to the it's on the second floor, just at the top of the stairs to the right. Um, so welcome, Diedrich. Hey, Veronica. Hello, everyone. And wave just so everyone can see you. Can everyone see him? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're so thrilled to have you back in uh, in Texas, so to speak. You're you're actually talking from your LA studio, joining us from your LA studio. But as a little bit of background on Diedrich, he uh, is is a Texas native. Um, he's from Mejia, Texas, and I know you moved around a lot as a kid and went to school in Texas and went to high school in Colleen. So you consider Texas um, home. So we're thrilled to have the show in your in your home state and have you um, in conversation uh, a few notes before we get started before we start looking at all these wonderful images and talk about the exhibition i just wanted to say that um we can't hear you your audio is muted um, but that's good if you decide to make yourself a cup of coffee or something um and but if you do have questions please we welcome them just put them in the q a tab if you um, click at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a couple of buttons and um, the Q&A is where we'll, I'll keep a close eye on it and we'll also leave some time at the end of the conversation so that DJ can answer your questions. So um, just throw them in there. And now let's get started. Krista, if you can advance the slides. I still call them slides even though we're PowerPoint. Um, so just wanted to say, just introduce the show before I ask you a few questions, Diedrich. I just also wanna thank the New Museum in New York and especially curator Margot Norton who organized this brilliant exhibition, um, which I was lucky enough to see back in the world when we were all traveling. And I saw it at the New Museum and was blown away. And we, are, we rarely show um, exhibitions that are organized by other museums in our contemporary project space, but we knew that we had to exhibit this work. And um, it, there are nine weavings in the show. And what I was really, what a bit of serendipity though, is that we um, are showing this during a pandemic. That's not serendipity, but I, I feel, Diedrich, that uh, that weavings, just the tactile nature of them, there's something, even though we can't touch them in the galleries, there's something comforting about them and there's um, a bodily response. And I think all of us can relate to wrapping ourselves in a blanket and the comfort of textiles that I think is providing a lot of uh, solace and joy for a lot of us. I know it is, it is for me, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I also just wanted to say, just as a brief introduction, that uh, that Diedrich, as I mentioned, he's from Texas, but he um, moved to California for graduate school after attending the University of North Texas as an undergrad. He moved to San Francisco to attend the college, uh, California College of Arts, and ended up moving down to LA, where you've been based ever since. Um, you've won a, a lot of wonderful awards, which I too many to list here. Um, but I, uh, this is your first sort of major museum exhibition, one of many to come, um, and uh, and we're just thrilled to have you. So so thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, you can advance the slide, Krista. So Diedrich, these are the, all the works in the show I know are recently made, and I thought um, it would be great to just share with folks how you became so, I, I know that your first encounter with um, weaving, you were kind of instantly hooked. Can you share a little bit about that and what drew you to, what, what makes you love the medium so much? Yeah, of course. Um, I have been weaving since 2008. Um, and I learned at the University of North Texas um, in what was the fiber department at the time. And I had been, had been suggested to me by a professor um, in an intro class to, to think about taking a, a fiber class. Um, so that summer of my freshman year, I signed up for weaving and um, walked into a room filled with these beautiful machines that I had no um, conception of before this um, in a sunlit room and just immediately kind of fell in love with just the the, the look of the space 
Um, but there's something about the process, how sort of meditative, all of these things, I think, um, that make up what it is to sort of create just in themselves um, are spellbinding. I think there's just something about the, the seeing someone weaving, weaving yourself that just kind of takes you over. Um, yeah, so from the very beginning, just the process itself had me. Uh, I also, um, I love I love hearing about that and imagine the colors of the yarn uh, being, you know, when I came to your studio and saw all the spools of yarn, that was um, instantly hooked me too. But um, I'm interested in, in all of these works that are in the exhibition, there's a black silhouette in each of them. And um, I read them as male because I've looked at them, I read them as male, but they're pretty open-ended and they could be, uh, I think, um, anyone. And I, I like that they're not incredibly specific, but I'm curious about, I know that, you're, that you've toggled between abstraction and figuration and that in your work, you often combine those languages, but I, I would love to, to, would you share a little bit about how you arrived at the figure here and, and what's important to you about these bodies in particular in these three weavings? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that there is like a, um, God, it's like a essay maybe, but I think that there is a long um, tradition of the silhouette in particular that I was pulling from um, to think of the ways that contemporary artists have used it from sort of a Kira Walker um, to um, not quite silhouette, but the way that Kerry James Marshall's figures are like absolutely black. Um, Belkis Ion, who I think is in our presentation. Um, but then I think about the kind of colored silhouettes of an Aaron Douglas, someone uh, like huge in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, there was this wealth of um, makers who were available to me and my lexicon who sort of used the silhouette to think about these kind of psychological, historical, um, uh, I want to say every man, but I would actually say um, a, a very specific uh, person is being conjured with those silhouettes um, and particular histories. And I think for me, I wanted to participate in this similar um, way of seeing and talking about the world through, through these figures. Um, and I use myself as the reference point um, because it is the, the body that I know best and is always available. Um, and so while there is some element of kind of um, injecting my own story, I think of them as sort of this template to think about these kind of larger stories that I, that I am a part of. Mm. And I love that there seems to be care and sort of self-care in all of these uh, and these three, these three works, especially the work on the on the left with, you know, the body wrapped in it. I love that it's a textile depicting a textile, you know, a weaving that depicts a blanket enveloping a body. And I wondered if you could talk about the sort of um, the care and the the. I know that you you made these kind of in response to um, some historic some current events, and I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit about where you, what those were. Yes. Um, these were made in, oh my gosh, 2017. Yeah. <laughs> and they were sort of, uh, for me, coming off of the hills of making work that was a little bit, or very much in comparison, more abstract, but that was um, explicitly thinking about um, the ways that the, the Black bodies I was seeing sort of in the uh, mainstream media and news um, were those who had died from, or were murdered from uh, police violence, vigilante justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it felt like um, it was a particular moment where the, the, the great majority of bodies that I was seeing that were black were these that were sort of um, dead or dying or in peril. Um, and there was just this inundation of those images. Um, and then I would say right around this time, um, it, there was this groundswell of like um, media portrayal of black folks in all sorts of capacities and uh, doing all kinds of things, both kind of 
fictional and historical and um it was really exciting it was one of these moments where i was like oh this is like a uh, a golden age to see black bodies sort of having all kinds of experiences so for me i was really interested in making um these figures that that might add to that participate talk back to that um moment and so i was wanted to have these bodies that were in repose, that were resting, that were doing anything but um, dying. Um, so that was like a, a crucial moment to sort of get, work something out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really appreciate learning that and understanding that. Um, Krista, you can advance the, the slide. I also just wanted to give people images, do not, reproductions do not do this work justice. These are two details that I took from my cell phone. Um, and you can just see, I think, Diedrich's amazing sense of color, which we'll talk about in a moment. I'm going to save that for, for a bit, but I just wanted everyone to see how beautiful these are up close. And again, that sense of touch and tactility that I think makes these, adds on to your layer of care and self-care, that there's a sense of comfort that I feel many of us respond to in textiles. All right, and then we'll just go one more forward. Um, this has become one of my favorite works in the show. It wasn't initially, and now I've just, I keep finding myself returning to this cast iron uh, tub. And um, you can't tell in the image that, you know, you, the, the, there's the way you use the yarn here. It's maybe one of the few silhouettes that's not purely black. It has red and some metallics in it. But I also see, I love, there's kind of a nod to Americana here, the, the red, white, and blue and, um, that I think is, is, is really beautiful. Um, and I know you have a, a secret love of Americana that I think comes, comes <laughs> speaking in. Uh, but, let's, but let's keep advancing. Well, let's, let's advance one more um, because I do want to talk about color. And I think that I believe that um, I, I found it so interesting that you dye your own yarn. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about materials. And not only do you dye your own yarn, but you show up in the studio wearing clothes that match the, the yarn you're about to dye. Um, but here we really, and, and if you advance one more, uh, Krista, yeah, I think we can see, thank you for this, to the studio and to Adrian for sharing these great images of you, you know, in the studio in LA, um, getting the color that you want. And, um, and why is that important to you or a joy to you or, you know, I think, I'm curious about where, how you arrive at color. Yeah, um, I, I think oh, it's something I feel like that has developed over time. Um, but in my education at the University of North Texas, um, the fiber program was really instrumental, I think, in sort of helping me fine tune a sense of color and thinking mm -hmm. about color theory. Um, and unlike the way color functions in some other mediums, it is um, color is transparent is the way that um, I was taught to think about it and that I, I still think about it today. So like every sort of drop of dye or pigment that goes into the, the bath sort of um, resurfaces, even if it's sort of just is a, a tint or a shade, a, a shift. Um, but I, with my uh, professor, Amy Adelman, uh, she really emphasized uh, as a part of our education, just this um, exploration of color and thinking about color theory. Um, and so I think it's something that has um, just become embedded in my thinking about just like the ways that colors are interacting in the world or in the studio. Um, and I, I get so sort of caught up in thinking about maybe what the color schemes are going to be for the next show that, as you were saying, like, I'll walk into the studio, sit down at the loom and be like, oh, like I, I'm wearing the colors that I've been thinking about that are on the loom and in, in combinations that I would never otherwise, you know, think that I would put them together. And then I'm like, oh, here we are. Um, and I, I mean, I think it is influenced by um, the season sort of broadly in this kind of natural way, but also the sort of things that people start to do in the world or what they wear on their body. And I think I'm always kind of looking at it to find uh, more inspiration. Yeah, and I loved, you know, your last show in LA at various small fires that all had a cohesive color 
thread to it. And um, I think it's almost like when you look back, you know, 10 years from now on your weavings, you'll be able to tell when they were made because you'll remember, oh, that was that summer. You know, the same way that you look at clothes from your childhood and you can like immediately place them. But I think you'll have the same color will be kind of your your shortcut too. Um, We can keep going uh, to the next slide, great. Um, and so this is sort of the col- these are some of the colors that you, this is, I think, the first weaving in the show where, you, where you're, you, you're dyeing all the color, you know, you're dyeing the yarn yourself. Um, and, I'm, and I'm struck also, Diedrich, as you've developed your work and it's grown in scale, is also the way that, um, and so this is a larger, a larger work. I love the way that you don't always finish uh, certain, there's sort of a, a tension between like a really beautiful weave that's precise. And I think of weavings as often very precise and there are moments in your weavings that are like that. But then here we see a figure in a horse and the horse is not completely filled in. Um, is that just a sort of intuitive, I'm curious, maybe that's not a conscious decision on your part, but I'm curious about the kind of play between this sort of uh, the, 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 the perfection and then also these sort of moments of looseness because it almost seems painterly to me at times when I, when I look at these works. Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of that has uh, been in response to sort of, uh, I mean, participating in a contemporary art world that is inundated with painters. Um, look, the graduate education that I had, um, the half of my sort of peers were painters. So I think it really started to shift um, what kinds of concerns I had about uh, the picture plane <laughs> to, to borrow some of that language. But, um, and I think textiles in and of themselves have always been so heavily um, abstract, even when they're figurative. And I think um, I, I really am a student of, of that as well and think about the ways that uh, how much it takes to kind of articulate a certain kind of thing. Um, stitching into the surfaces of the weavings is something that I really love to do. Um, so there are moments where I realize um, there are things that I might go in and fill in to the weaving after and have planned that up front. But once it's done, I start to um, respond to the weaving as opposed to the plan. Um, and so for me, noise over here. Uh, the, these moments for improvisation become really important um, to start to think about how I can engage with um, these histories of quilting or with drawing. Um, and drawing in particular, I feel like I, I want the weavings to feel more organic than what the loom allows. So these moments give me a chance to kind of intervene and um, be a little bit more fluid. Yeah. Um... And that kind of connects beautifully to this, one of my favorite weavings in the show, I, although I guess I have a lot of favorites at this point, but um, Break and Tremble, which is, we got a question already about um, how you decide between installing weavings directly on the wall versus suspended in the middle of the gallery space like this work, Break and Tremble. But I, um, so let's talk about that in a second, but I did want to also ask about um, about this your connection to animals in the show is really interesting to me. So most of the the works in the show, and you can see a work on the left, the cup is a cloud that has goats in it. So there's there's a quite a bit of of animal imagery in here, and um, I'm I'm really struck by your title, Diedrich, "Break and Tremble," and um, this notion of you know I I know very little about horses, but I know that to break a horse is sort of to tame it, right? And I'm like, who's being broken here? Um, there's a really interesting relationship between the horse and the figure. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the way you actually wove this, because it seems like the, there's loose threads. Um, and then it also even seems like the, the body is woven maybe separately on top of the rest of the weaving. Is that, am I getting that right? Can you talk a little bit about the process of making this? Yeah, so the the weaving itself um, is uh, I always it's three layers I suppose you could think of it as, but I think of it sort of like two and a half. Uh, so there is a yellow layer and a blue layer that sort of interlace, and one can be on top and the other can be on bottom. Um, and then this black layer is kind of the 
the hidden third layer. So what happens is that there are uh, smaller gauge threads that kind of trap the black thread just on the surface in such a way that um, mm -hmm. I can articulate these black shapes exactly in one place as opposed to having to go take a thread all the way across the whole surface, mm -hmm. um, which is what happens with the blue and yellow. Um, and as you were asking about these kind of loose threads, um, there's a lot of kind of hand stitching on the surface of this particular one um, after the fact. So like the this kind of leg that's not filled in um, or like the kind of articulations of that tree in black. Um, and I, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I answered all the questions. No, you, you did because I think there's something <laughs> No, there's something so interesting about the the third layer that you described, and I I couldn't help but to read the the way the dangling um, uh, yarn emerges from the figure. It kind of feels like like tears. Um, it's just such a power. It's a very powerful pose and gesture, and I think you really have the ability. I mean, for a silhouette, you'd think that that's a pretty limiting form, but you you have such a sense. I think such a powerful sense of. Of, of gesture um, that communicates th so many different things, but it also feels very open-ended. Um, I see the the yellow yarn and the black yarn. It kind of looks like a lasso a little bit at, at times, um, or but then then it also feels like a noose to me. So there's just it seems like there's a lot going on, and that tree is not really that tree-like. You kind of turned it into something else. What happened there? It became like a, a flag. <laughs> um. Yes. <laughs> I love that. There's this sort of impulse for me to to fall back into these kind of rectilinear shapes because the loom loves them. Um, not to uh, overly anthropomorphize the loom, but I, but it is good at doing kind of square and rectangle and box and stripe and these things. So um, for me, I was really interested in, with this tree and sort of preserving some of that um, boxiness, but then breaking it with the stitching to really kind of cue into this idea of it being a, a tree. Um, and I think for me, it's important to have these moments of kind of um, uh, clunkiness, I suppose. Because I mean, I think for me, when I, I look at this weaving and I see that tail of the horse, like it's clear that the the maker being me, but that I have the ability to sort of finely articulate a thing so that I I hope that a viewer looks at these moments where it sort of falls or breaks as, as intentional and trying to um, to play with that kind of push and pull of, uh, of the material, the medium, the kind of conceptual, all of, all of those things. Well, Diedrich, I have to say, I take a little bit of delight that this work is when you, if you're in the Blanton galleries, you're essentially staring at the Bullock Texas History Museum is just behind us. So you're like, I, I look at this work and I just think about all the depictions of white cowboys that are across the street that your work is basically in a standoff with. And, um, you know, the, the number of times that, that, I mean, that that museum is filled with sort of stereotypical depictions of um, cowboys and these sort of dom dominating their horses and this bravado and there's something so much more um, compelling and interesting about about this image and Krista I'll have you go forward I want to look at the detail I think we have of what Diedrich was talking about here I think you really see the way the black figure is a third layer that's on top it has a sort of sculptural presence and then I also wanted to advance one more um, I love this the, the fact that you just decided to install this on a sort of scaffolding. Um, and we got a question about that. And can you talk about what, why you made that decision and how you, what you get from that and how you make, how you made that decision? Yeah, um, so I, um, for me, a lot of the, the act of weaving itself is so sculptural and I think, um, it retains almost none of this kind of sculptural quality once it's on the wall. Um, but it's something I've been thinking through for a long time. Um, and so I got help fabricating these structures. Um, and I really was looking at tapestry looms, which um, look basically like this stand does with a few extra pieces of wood in there. Um, and I wanted to sort of engage with that history to kind of 
um, point back to some of these histories that inspire the work. Um, and I knew that if, if people could sort of oscillate around them, you could start to, even if not, you know, replicate, you would start to be able to understand some of the kind of technical things that are happening around this idea that um, that sort of third layer is just on the front and thinking about even that there are two layers of fabric happening, interacting here, right? That it's kind of mm -hmm. um, opposite on the, the back as it is the front with the, the colors. Um, and um, I hung them on these stands, I think to engage with space more mm -hmm. um, and to be able to have the viewer really in their body in the presence of them in the ways that I think they already are because they're textiles, but um, yeah, these kind of cascades of yarn and being able to kind of, um, move in and around them. And do you think you'll continue to explore that going forward? Is it is it a scale thing? Does it work? I mean, I would imagine that a very small weaving maybe you wouldn't want necessarily to put it on a stand. I mean, I'm just curious if you think you'll explore this a bit more or... Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I really have an impulse for sculpture, even, cool. even the weaving lends itself so easily to being read and viewed as, as two dimensional. So it, it is something I, I think about and thinking through how to kind of keep playing with this. Um, yeah, I found it really fascinating. I think for those of us who aren't weavers to that, I think you have a completely different appreciation of your process when you see them on the stands because for one the horse went from being sort of yellow to to, to blue purple um so the to to see the way you're able to reverse the colors really interesting and it really does help us get into your studio and into your process but yeah. i really love the way um the, the figure is so dominant on the front and then it becomes something different on the back. It becomes, you know, the figure disappears. And I think that's really beautiful too, the parts that sort of dis dissolve or disappear. Um, yeah. Really beautiful. All right, we can keep going. And um, so the next few works are the works that I first saw when I first was introduced to your work. This was in a, an amazing um, exhibition called Made in LA uh, in 2018 you made one this was one of three works and um and i remember seeing this and just really being uh struck by it and i um and and feeling that it wasn't a literal depiction of something it, it had a very uh maybe like an allegorical feeling to me especially with the um shackles or the uh, uh down at the bottom of the of the weaving and Absolutely. and the way you depicted the water um yeah is really quite beautiful but um, so let's talk about, this is part of a body of work where you're depicting animals of different kinds, but I think this is the, the animal of animals for you, the catfish. Uh, you've referred to them as your faithful attendants. Um, you know, they surface again and again in your work, and I'm curious about what draws you to them, and, can, and if you can elaborate a little bit about um, why you started. Was this the first work that you made? Catfish? No, this is maybe the third or fourth. Okay. Um, they, they were already becoming like this this thing. Um, I this is one of those things that I feel like will uh, you know there's certain questions and things that come up all the time, and this is one I never get tired of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think for me, the catfish first is like the most um, southern of creatures, so. Th this is one of the kind of draws to it. Um, in graduate school, I was reading about um, Terry Fox. No, mm -hmm. Terry Fox, yeah. Um, who was a performance artist from the 70s who did a lot of work with fish. Um, and there was one performance in, in specific where he um, tethered himself to a couple fish in a gallery and um, fell asleep and the fish were alive and sort of um, the, the, they eventually expire um, tethered to him by these strings. And so there were, he had a lot of kind of um, heart problems uh, throughout his life. And so he was always thinking about this kind of the fragility of his own heart and these creatures. Um, and I think for me, it was one of these kind of lightning rod moments where it started me thinking about how I wanted to interact with these these animals that I had been thinking about. And um, so I started making 
drawings and thinking through and then started making weavings and connecting them to these kind of um, stories that I was already familiar with, um, both kind of mythological and historical. Um, and I really think about them as um, their connection to sustenance, but also um, the ways that they are kind of um, not quite villainized, but thought of as undesirable, that they're scavengers, they're bottom feeders. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, fishing stories about how they will eat anything, they can live anywhere, they can go on land, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think um, in this country in particular, we have like a long history of animalizing uh, black folks and uh, other, I mean, other folks of color. And, and for me, it was like, if, if this is the case, then I want to figure out ways to sort of celebrate this animal and, and continue to identify with it and thinking about Texas as one of these places that like consumes catfish, you know, more than other places in the country. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt like, uh, it sort of just dovetailed with all these other things I was already thinking about. Yeah, what you said about being a scavenger and like eating everything, it, it also speaks to, you're right, it's not halibut, right? It, it's a very, it has a very different history, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, it's also, it, perseveres like it, it it can survive just about anything um so there's something kind of beautiful about us and um i also really was drawn immediately to the title when i saw this work i didn't know that you were depicting um or referencing an actual historical event that that happened in 1981 in your hometown which we can get to but um i i was drawn to the title because it it, it made me think that there was something um, there was a little bit of tragedy amidst this uh, drown and jubilee. Um, so even though the two the two men that you see here are alive and seem to uh, that that you sense there's something something about the title kind of hints at trouble and um, and 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 tragedy. So I, can you share a little bit about and also the word jubilee is so specific um, and I think maybe connected to the Juneteenth that you're referencing. Can you share a little bit about that uh, about that event that history that inspired the work? Absolutely. Um, so the the event that um, Veronica's talking about in 1981 um, at a Juneteenth celebration um, in Mejia, Texas, um, at this moment in history, it was one of the largest Juneteenth celebrations um, in the in the world. It's easy to say. I mean, it's it's Texas specific, but whatever. It like. 20 to 30,000 people would show up. Um, and it, it was uh, like one of the largest in the state. People would come from all over the place, all over the country to, to be here on kind of um, these ancestral lands. Um, and the way that the park is situated, there's kind of one way in, one way out. Um, and so these three young men um, were arrested for possession of marijuana and because of the kind of uh, flow of traffic, the cops decided to put them in a boat to transport them across to the local uh, sheriff station. And partway across the lake, the boat capsizes. The four police officers in the boat either swim or are saved. And the three men who are um, according to the locals, handcuffed, drowned. Um, and the police claim that they, they weren't handcuffed, they just drowned. Um, but it, I mean, it's a small town where everyone knows everyone and they say, you know, the men could swim and, you know, regardless of any of these things, um, they weren't given life jacket, you know, it goes on and on. And um, so this was, why can't I do math? Seven, eight years before I was born. Yeah. And it is also this story that has um, shaped my, my understanding of this place. Like it's a story I heard all my life before I was like really conscious to understand what Juneteenth was or that mm -hmm. this was in my hometown or that um, it used to draw this many people. And now, you know, if 200 people are there, it's like a success. Um, and so for me, when I was working on this show, thinking about these things again as an adult, I was just kind of like a gut punch to think about the idea that sort of 
the center of black liberation in this country and the place where it has been celebrated um, almost since day one it has it's sort of had the bottom kind of ripped out of it by this kind of horrific event that so mirrors uh, many of the things that we're still sort of uh, like fighting um, and thinking about and protesting today. So I, I really wanted to make a piece of uh, related to this event that thought about um, kind of the particulars and what um, uh, mythologizing or reimagining or what the, the thing one might be longing for uh, could be like re-envisioned. Um, so this is the sort of thinking about these handcuffs, the three men in question become the catfish, um, thinking about um, drawing on a lot of uh, mythology and religions where like heaven is sort of situated in a, in a body of water or inside the earth as opposed to this kind of sky. So the catfish for me has become this kind of ancestor, uh, spirit, um, many of these other kind of ways of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and the fact that it was that you're describing this sort of horrific event that happened, but that you don't depict that trauma, that horrific event that we didn't get to watch anyway, but the fact that you reimagine these young men as um, catfish, I find really striking and powerful. And it feels also like a biblical story, like where, where people get to, you know, where, where um, they're somehow redeemed or the story, there, there's something very loving I find about this work and especially in the gesture of the man on the right, just the way he's even holding the catfish. Um, it almost seems like uh, it, there's something very tender about, about that, um, that, uh, that I think is a really interesting decision on your part to, to how you've captured this. Um, but let's talk a little more about maligned animals. We'll keep going on the, to look at the next image because um, I'm, and this is just some great details to give you guys a sense of the great color that's in this work. And then we'll keep going. Um, so when I visited the studio, I know you and I talked about this, uh, that you grew up in a Southern Baptist family and community and, um, and I think that we, I, I think it's hard not to pick up, I think, especially in these works in part because of the, the, uh, the architecture maybe, but, um, but just the sense of, 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 of that sort of biblical training that you have. And, um, but I'm really interested in the way you depict sort of malign animals, because I don't, I didn't know, I'm not somebody who's read the Bible closely and I didn't know that goats were sort of trickster animals. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the relationships that you're setting up between the figures and the animals here, but also the relationship between, between the figures, because that feels a little bit open-ended to me, but um, I'm curious how you, you know, how you see this. Yeah, I mean, so in, in, I mean, in both cases, these goats and then on the, right, the pig mm -hmm. um, is the animal on the kind of pink surface um, or gold surface, pink animal. Um, they are uh, animals that are biblically considered unclean. Um, so animals that one should not eat. Um, and, and I think so much about like growing up and like I could go home and like my grandfather would have like some unnameable creature's body pot part on the stove and be like, do you want some of the thing, right? And so I think these people who, who um, I grew up with and loved and all of these things who were very devout, but who were also like doing these things that were like in the sort of black and white of the, the, the Bible that they sort of were holding up ha has always been interesting to me. Um, and so for me, I started to think about using these animals um, to sort of honor that history and to fill in these gaps of um, sort of in what I felt like what was happening is like injecting um, our own lived experience into these old texts that sort of didn't quite reflect it anymore, right? So I think um, that I respect my family's reverence for these things, but also really love to investigate like where the kind of fractures are and how um, I fit in and how I can inject um, my own worldview into these things, thinking about them as vehicles for maybe self transformation. Um, in the case of um, these animals that have been so like uh, maligned or, or uh, aligned with 
evil or the devil or all these things, but like, what does it mean to sort of reclaim or um, part that, crack that open to, to think about um, creating tapestries to just like reflect my own lived experience and desires and um, all of that. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the gestures are, I think are really interesting. I read the one with the pig, the, the gesture seems to be one of blessing and tenderness. Like there's something very uh, loving about that gesture. And then on the left, I feel like you've exaggerated the hands, it's, they're so mighty and there's just a sense of offering. And, um, but I also think it, 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 you, you start to create these interesting relationships that make us think about also masculinity, not just about the animals, but about the male figure and what, how we're used to seeing male figures in art and art history. I mean, it made me think about what limited ways that we often are, are shown male, male figures interacting with one another um, and often in dominant ways. So if we think about break and tremble and the relationship between the man and the horse, there's always like one dominant, you know, power. And I feel like you're exploring something much more interesting here that we don't often get to see. Um, so, uh, well, we'll, we are going to get to questions soon because actually they've just been filling up the feed. So I want to just very quickly, because Diedrich has been, um, very generously talking about his work. I want to advance to um, art. This is a special section we created for you, Diedrich. Artist Diedrich loves and that y'all should know. And some of these were artists that I already knew and quite a few of them, whenever you know, a new interview comes out with you, Diedrich, I'm Googling you know, a, a writer or an artist and there are a few in here that have been an amazing discovery. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna go through this really quickly and I'm just gonna ask you to say one or two words about um, either the, 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 in this case, your relationship maybe to writing. I know it's not fair to ask you to say one or two words, but we'll just um, keep going from, from slide after you, after you offer a few thoughts about your encounter with these artists, how they are important to you, anything you want to share. Yeah, uh, I mean, I also with Gwendolyn Brooks, I will say um, she's like the mother of uh, Black poetry and uh, American Black poetry, and there's something so, so, um, the first poem in this book is like 20 pages or something and it reads, it's the breakneck speed, it pulls you in um, relative to what's going on um, in the world right now. It's, it's so great to read and it's gotta be 30 years old. Um, Fishbone or Amy Nizuka Matado's work in general is brilliant. There's a lot of water, um, a love of animals of the sea in particular and the way it, that she uses them to think about like uh, relationships to her family is is brilliant. She's based in Mississippi, so another kind of uh, Southern loving person. Um, Essex Hemphill is the roadmap to my life. Um, and yeah. <laughs> That's great. And now we'll get to um, the unicorn tapestries. Um, I, have been obsessed with these tapestries for a long time. And I think they have been a blueprint for me to understand my relationship to um, the history of textiles and to how to sort of use the catfish um, to communicate this broad range of things. Um, yeah. Great, and I, uh, my colleague Carter Foster also reminded me that you know they were they, the tapestries historically were often worth more valuable than paintings, and that notions that we have about craft and painting are very modern inventions. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I know this is another mecca for you, uh, the ladder for Booker T. Washington, not far from um, Austin, uh, and I think one of the great sculptures of the 20th um, century. I made my pilgrimage this summer to go see it. And I was so happy that to be in an institution and to, that it was open and that I could, you know, see this thing I've been looking at for over a decade. Mm. Oh, incredible. Okay, this was the artist I had to Google and who I've become completely <laughs> obsessed with. Hannah Regan, am I saying her name right, Diedrich? Is that I'm right? Hannah Regan, but... Hannah Regan, okay. Don't be mispronouncing um, <laughs> Yeah, so these a Norwegian uh, weaver who I understand maybe raised her own sheep and then the wool, she dyed her own, the wool from her own sheep into these incredible anti-fascist 
textiles and very political from the 1940s and 50s. But um, but how in the world did you come across her and um, and and will you share a little more about her? <laughs> um, I didn't find her until um, maybe a few years ago. Like I had been making figurative weavings and someone was like, well, if you are doing that, you have to look at these. And it was like, I mean, there's, they are startling. Like I think there's something about the the color, the energy, the um, the fact that they are. Um, I mean, uh, may maybe they're propaganda. Maybe they're just a step away. But thinking about the time in which they are made and the turmoil of the world, and that like uh, something that's so slow, uh, this art form that in real time she's capturing, like you know, all of these stories and. Um, hmm. It's yeah, they they're they're brilliant. Unbelievable. There's there's one I found with like LBJ as well that was right. it, I was just blown away. Um, and then G's Bend. Um, you can't talk about textiles in America and not talk about the quilters of G's Bend. Um, so we have this image, which somehow the colorways just reminded me of you and this and this work. This one's got a particularly beautiful. Um, sense of color. And then there's one more, I think there's one more image. Let's see if we have a second one. Um, but I wanted to include this one too, because you've even made work that references the the goose chase pattern. And um, can you talk about what you have been most inspired by with, with um, G's band quilts? You know, I, I almost feel like you can't talk about contemporary art without talking about uh, or not American contemporary art without talking about the G's Bend quilters. Um, I think there's so much uh, kinship uh, between what they've done and what sort of um, early abstraction was attempting to do. And that these women who were in this kind of, um, like, I mean, no, no man's land in terms of like where it was situated in, in reference to like a city or like any other way to kind of get it out into the world. Um, and that they made this work um, and its relationship to kind of uh, the domestic space, right? That so much of it was meant so explicitly and specifically for the community. Um, but I, I think it has affected so many artists work in and outside of textiles um and it is okay. even though it is so celebrated is not nearly celebrated enough <laughs> um, and thinking about them as a collective as opposed to this individual like there's so much about it that just is heartening and seems like a roadmap for what art making in our community could look like I would love to see a show with G's Bend and a, a, a large group of contemporary artists because when you talk to me about how much you love this work and admire this work, um, Jeffrey Gibson also talked to me about that. Um, I think Sanford Bigger's show that's in New York has uh, lots of nods to these women. And I think you're right, the fact that it's not a single individual in America, we love to, we like have this little, we worship individuals. And I think the fact that it's the collective means that, um, and they're based in, in rural Alabama. Um, so I think though the collective nature of it and the fact that it's been passed on from one generation generation of women to another and we have I think the earliest quilts we know about that we still have are from like the 30s but it's generations of women who are still keeping this tradition alive and um yeah anyway we could go on we'll keep going otherwise we'll I think this is a work where you make a nice a, a nod to flying geese and and to G's Ben but it's in all of your work really um and then you mentioned Belki Sayon uh earlier with with your conversation about the silhouette yeah I met Belkis, um, or the work really is what I mean, because she passed away in her early 30s. Um, on my birthday in like 20, I can't remember exactly when the show was, but it was at the Fowler in 2016 or 2017. Yeah. Um, and several people had been like, you should go see it, you should go see it. And a friend dragged me and I was like, I, I'm like, so startled, <laughs> so rattled, so amazed um, by the ways that like symbolism is so loaded into the work. Um, there's this fish that sort of swims in and out of all of the works. Um, and it's, it's technically so beautiful and fragile. And um, this silhouette, like we were talking about, 
um, and an engagement with myth and religion and mm -hmm. just like all of the things that I so love. Um, and I had not heard about this, this woman's work before. Um, and yeah. What a great birthday present. Okay, I think this may be, this is the show, that same show traveled to Houston and blew me away as well. I was completely um, just overwhelmed in the best possible way. One of those shows that will stand out, you know, for the past decade for me. Um, and is that the last one? Let's see if that's the last one. There's one more. Oh, nope. Last but not least, another artist who I didn't know well until you mentioned him to me. So Rotimi's work traveled into my life through Essex Hemp. Hill, the poet I was talking about, has made uh, like a iconic photo of, of him, um, and so then I sort of connected these these dots. So great. Well, I hope that for all of you that was as much fun as it was for me, and that you um, wrote some of these names down. Uh, I can share them with you later as well to look them up. Um, I want to give. There's tons of questions here, so I'm going to do my best to I can answer um, this one about to answer that. a few of them. Yeah, a lot of questions. Yeah, sorry. Can you see them too, Diedrich? I can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we can tag team um, getting through these, but. Um, and let's see. Oh yeah, somebody, somebody, Cindy Stewart mentioned something I also was struck by that uh, that that you often combine three weavings, which reminds her of Christian triptychs and for me altarpieces. So I absolutely agree with you, Cindy. And I said the same thing when I visited a studio. But it also has to do with the fact that you only like to you have specific sizes of looms that you really like to work with, right, Diedrich? You don't want to work with a giant loom. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I want to make nods to both quilting and these West African traditions where things are pieced together to make larger works, not uh, a larger loom to make a bigger work. Um, um, and then there was, I mean, a lot of questions about dyeing. So I use a commercial grade textile dye uh, usually. Every once in a while, some other strange thing creeps in, um, but it's because you get the most control, the brightest or the darkest or the whatever color. Um, and there was something about the sketching. So I do make uh, preparatory sketches um, and then I blow them up to the scale that the piece is gonna be. I cut that up and use it as a, a guide as I weave. Um, and have you, uh, we got a related question. A lot of questions about process, which is nice. Um, have there been any errors that have occurred that ended up informing later work? Um, or, or things that happened that you didn't expect that kind of sh shifted things? Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think of something specific. I mean, I think that there's a lot of, I do sort of have these moments where I want to just try to weave a, a technique um, that I don't traditionally work with. So I might set up a little sample and then I'm like, okay, now I'm going to make a whole body of work using this thing um, that I hadn't previously been interested in. So there is a little sampling that happens, um, but a lot of the things relative to like what we saw today, I've been doing so long that I can like almost weave it in my sleep. <laughs> Even, but I leave space for like the improv or the weirdness or the whatever. Well, and even the way you sometimes attach the panels, there's one, the one with the pig. If you get up close, the, the, the way you've attached the panels is a different color and it becomes this almost like it almost reminds me of like stitching on the body and they're almost, there's, there's something really interesting. You don't try to make that seamless. You make, the, you, you almost, yeah. make, it's like a little, um, um, we got a great question from Kalia about um, your, it says, can you, towards the bottom, can you describe in words the way you feel when creating with cotton yarn? I'm glad she asked about the material. Cotton being the material that's historically linked to the oppression of black people in America. Is, this, is it conscious that you're working with that? Do you acknowledge the material in any way? Um, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, cotton was the material that I was taught to weave with. So, um, I mean, this is what I learned to weave with. And it was a lot because it it's one of the more versatile things to weave with. It's um, it's pretty consistent in how it behaves, it takes color well, um, and it's cheap. Um, and I think as I continued to work, and even when I would try other materials, I'd always find myself gravitating back to cotton. Um, and it has been increasingly important for me to use this material almost exclusively because of its kind of historical um, 
footing in this country um, as it relates to slavery, as it relates to Texas, um, as it relates to like the, the very place that I'm from. And um, I sit down at the loom and I think it's the, the, the best gift to um, myself and my ancestors that I get to sort of use this material in a way that um, they did not. Hmm. It's beautiful. Um, let's see. And then there's, can you speak a little to your use of acrylic yarns alongside cotton, given that it's a material many weavers avoid? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, it's a little bit about um, weaving, I always say, is just entering its like uh, teenage years or something I don't know or it's re it's rebellious phase I think mm. um, as a as compared to other mediums people have already sort of had the freak outs done all the crazy things made work that um, bucks conventions and I think weavers are still kind of like these are the only materials I can use the back has to be finished in a very particular way um, I can only do X, Y, Z things. And, and I actually think that there's no space to dream or invent if we, we don't allow ourselves uh, to break the rules. Um, it's cheap, it's immediately available. It, it reads as all of those things. And I think for me, um, it's really exciting to um, have conversations of, of about why we prize, you know, fine yarns and, and often things that come from places that we can't go or um, are being extracted in awful ways. Not to say that acrylic is like a pure material either, but it, but it is here. Um, it's something that I feel like we are reckoning with. Um, and I, I don't That goes back, <laughs> but that also goes back to what you said about G's Bend, you know, as a touchstone and roadmap for so many artists, because a lot of those pieces um, in the quilts are from worn clothing, you know, and, and not precious materials. And I think part of what makes those works so powerful is how beautiful they are from, you know, things that have been worn while working, sweated, you know, people have sweat in them, there's, and, and that they are so beautiful and that it's not about fancy fine materials. But um, we, I think we've pretty much run out of time, but there were two questions about scale. So I thought I should at least try to get you to answer um, questions about significance of scale and sort of if that's something you're, you know, exploring more now. Um, and why, if certain scenes or narratives lend themselves to larger scale in your mind, like how do you make that decision? Like, oh, I'm gonna make something to scale. Yeah, uh, so I work at a, about, I'm um, not exclusively, but when there's figures, I work at about a six foot uh, scale, whether that's just height or height and width. Um, and sometimes I go to eight foot and it's, it's for me, um, it's because they're almost full scale, like the, the figures and things. So when a viewer is in front of the work, they can feel kind of enveloped in it. Um, and it is also about the size of a queen size uh, bed or a curtained window or all these other kind of domestic um, uh, textiles that we're used to or a rug, you know, all of these mm -hmm. things. So I want to have those resonances. Um, I think it is a, about the scale that I will always work. I mean, I, I think for me, I'm not currently interested in like making monumental, you know, 20 foot tapestries. Uh, and a lot of that is because I, I work with uh, my studio manager, Adrian, who helps me do a lot of the kind of prep. And I mean, Adrian saves my, my life every day, like working with Adrian is great, but I don't want to be I want to touch everything. Like I can't imagine not doing all the weaving. I can't imagine um, them being made in some other country. Like my dedication is to the process more than it is to um, a glut of work or something. No, oh, I feel that in the work. Well, thank you for answering. I'm sorry we didn't get to the the all of the questions, but. The show, we did extend it because of the pandemic and um, the museum is open. You do need to make a reservation, but um, the show is up through May 16th. And I know I showed you guys a few details, but really nothing can prepare you for the experience. And I think some of these questions will be answered about the sort of sculptural nature of these materials. Really, um, you want to get up close to them. And 
Um, so Diedrich, thank you so, so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have your work and, um, and can't wait to see what's next for you. Um, in the meantime, I just wanna thank you all again for joining us. And before we go, just a couple of quick reminders, please plan to join us for our next curated conversation at five. That's, we always do them at five central standard time. It'll be next Tuesday, December 15th. And you'll get to hear um, Latin America, my wonderful colleague, Latin American art curator, Vanessa Davidson will be in conversation with Dr. Mariana Marchese of Argentina's National Fine Arts Museum. And they're gonna be talking about extreme abstraction, Argentine artists of the, the 60s, which I know will be great. Um, we also have a wonderful archive of all the past talks. So if you ever miss them or you wanna tell a friend about this one, it takes a couple of days before we post them, but they're all um, on YouTube. And you can also um, watch them at blantonmuseum.org backslash museum from home. And if you wanna show your support, you can become a member. We love our members. That's also uh, easy information on our website. Um, and if you wanna just hear about future programs, um, like this, you can sign up for our newsletter. But thank you and hope to see you all again next week. And thank you again, Dietrich, for joining us. Of course. Good night. <laughs>